Today in Mark's Game Room, we're going to review Men of Bronze, one of the Osprey Blue Book War Games rules about ancient Greek hoplite battles. The game has some interesting innovations, but also a few clunkers. Here's our review of Men of Bronze. Hey, welcome to the Game Room. If you've watched the Battle of Thermopylae video on Little Wars TV, then you saw that we use Men of Bronze to refight the battle. Now we also have some videos on our channel that use Men of Bronze, including the Battle of Marathon, so be sure to check that out. Men of Bronze is scale agnostic, meaning you can use any figures and basing that you have. It was originally intended for individually based 28mm figures, but we've used it with 6mm and 15mm miniatures. Alright guys, well, what do you think? Is it scale agnostic or not? Matt, what do you think? Yeah, it claims to be scale agnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, so. All, all of the images, all the beautiful illustrated material through the book make it seem like it's made for 28 millimeter single based. And they make one sort of comment at the very beginning that, hey, you could use it with whatever you want. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's really accurate. This, in particular, <laughs> the supporting rule seems right. to rely on individually based miniatures right. to make it make sense. You have to have a leader model positioned within your unit. If you have a whole base, that gets really complicated. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, it claims to be scale agnostic, but I don't feel like it, it is. Like, it didn't make any accommodations later saying, well, if your basing is a little different, think about it this way. It, it was just kind of, it was actually kind of hard to interpret it uh, because they don't give you guidance. It's really, I think, wants to be played with individual figures. And, and we tried it first with old um, DBA figures, DBA basing, because it's scale agnostic. Right. And we just ran into all kinds of confusion with the rules because it, I don't really think it is. So anyways, let's move on. Certainly. All right. So here are our pros and cons. Uh, we have the sequence of play, our combat resolution, presentation, Movement, and of course, guys, the fun factor. Fun factor, gotta have fun when yeah. playing our rules. Don't right? forget and the bonus round. Absolutely. Bonus round. You don't yeah. want to miss the bonus round on this one. All right, so let's get started then. All right. First up, let's look at the sequence of play. Each turn is broken down into four phases. One, calculate Arate points. Two, bid for initiative to determine who is the first player. Three, the first player activates all of his units, followed by the second player. Four, finish any compulsory moves and determine if one side has achieved victory. The key to the sequence of play is what the game calls Arate Points, which is defined as moral virtue. Arate Points can be spent through a turn to influence die rolls, have units use special abilities, and allow a player to try and steal the initiative. All right, so pros and cons for the uh, sequence of play. Um, I mean, just off the bat, I think this is a pro. Um, right. It is fairly well, one simple. Pro. Yeah, it, it's simple to follow. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't too difficult to look it up and try to understand in the rulebook at mm -hmm. certain points. Uh, although we do have comments on on the rulebook itself later. Um, but overall, starting out with the initiative, sort of bidding for for your turn sequence, I, I think that's a fairly popular and, and fun mm -hmm. sort of experiment to play at the beginning of each turn. Um, but that that was just something I noticed. The sequence play was pretty basic. I mean, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is what I consider the innovative part of the game. You have this pool of Arate points, and you get one point for every unit you have, right? So as the army starts to get beat up and you lose units, you get less of these points. But what they allow you to do is to kind of interrupt the sequence of play. You can try to like steal the initiative, re-roll some dice, uh, which is helpful. And also, because you're always looking for opportunities in the opponent's turn to play your Arate points, it keeps both sides engaged in the game. Right? I'm not so much a fan of games where one side does everything while the other side go has lunch mm -hmm. right, and then come back. So the Arate points really keep both sides engaged, I think, and there's many different ways to use them, so you're always thinking. Um, so I really like that. I'm going to give it a pro, uh, but the one thing I'm going to say about the Arate points is that I'm not, they're a real great game mechanic, but I'm not sure what they represent in ancient warfare. Mm -hmm. So a really great fun game mechanic, but I feel like you could use it in World War II, you know, black powder, whatever you want. So that's my take. What do you think, Matt? 
Yeah, I feel like what we get out of it is you get an interesting economy to work with. Mm-hmm. You have some resource management because uh, even even beyond just activating or stealing the turn order from other players, you need Arate points to do special things with units, to right. make them behave how you would right. imagine them to. So if you want to skirmish, uh, have a unit evade after they shoot, you need to spend points to do it. So I guess it's supposed to represent commander focus or commander intent, but I agree. I don't think it feels like an ancient mechanic. It, it doesn't make the game flow in a way that I imagine that an ancient battle might flow. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's a very cautionary plus for me in that it is innovative, it's interesting, it, it plays well as a game, but I don't think it captures that ancient feel very well. Right, okay. and, and something to add to that too, you mentioned the economy. You know, when you're playing one side uh, and you have a, a certain you know pool of chits and whatnot, yeah, you can use it for special abilities, you mm-hmm. can use it for the, the bidding side. Some players overbid and they lose half their chips, which is always fun because now they're at a disadvantage when they're playing their turn. But also you have to think about all the courage and morale rolls you have to make at the end because you can also re-roll those. And so you're constantly thinking, well, do I use this to do better in combat? Or do I save it for later? Because I'm probably going to lose the combat, but maybe I can win the morale right. back for that unit at some point, or you know, spend it to unwaver them. Um, so yeah, again, the, definitely a pro for the balancing. It makes it more fun and interactive, in my opinion. All right, so I think that's three pros. Although we got to, you know, two and a half. Maybe we, maybe <laughs> we should add something that's not pro and con. Maybe this should be pro con and neutral. There we go. Would you be, would you be a neutral? Uh, I would be a neutral here. Oh, okay. For sure. N- neutral's a cop out. All right. <laughs> <laughs> cop out. Oh. All right. You need to have an opinion. All right. That's, uh, <laughs> pro, you're pro minus. That's right. Okay. Pro minus. Pro minus. Next up is combat resolution. Combat between units is resolved with each side rolling a number of six-sided dice, achieving hits on rolls of four, five, or six. The number of hits is then divided by the armor of the target. Units can receive bonus dice, including for supporting units, although the supporting unit suffers the same fate as the unit it is supporting. Archery is conducted by the same procedure. To determine if a unit can fire at an enemy, you must draw a line of sight from the unit's leader to any point on the target. So for combat resolution, I think my greatest gripe and why I'm definitely going to give it a negative, a con, is that uh, I found one of the key elements of combat, which is support, to be extremely confusing. Yes, very it's, confusing. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really important part of ancient warfare is that you have very static battle lines, at least right. initially. So you need to have some support mechanic. And the way that it's executed in this game is, uh, I would say, haphazard at best. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. What do you think? Yeah, what do you think, Austin? Yeah, so... Just going off what you said, you know, you you have an ancient battle where you have lines of troops who are supposed to be supporting each other on the left and right. I mean, that was the whole point, really. And then when you have a a friendly unit come in contact with an enemy unit and you can pull support, well, now you've pulled two friendly units behind that unit and you created two gaps in the line. (laughs) So it, it puts you at a disadvantage if you go by the rules. Now, I could understand if this is all going by individually based models where you have a guy in combat against just one other guy and then you have somebody come right. behind him to support. You can see that in other rule sets and whatnot. But as a, a strictly unit based game, I don't think it necessarily works. So for, in my opinion, the support rules are, are somewhat of a con yeah. in, in my opinion. Somewhat. That's not decisive. <laughs> <laughs> Did I hear a neutral? It is, it is, it is a big con. It is all a right, big con. An ambiguous con. It's like historic con. It's the big con. Oh. Okay, all right. So I'm going to give this a con as well, and basically for what they said, right? The game was written for individually based figures based around the leader, mm-hmm. right? And when you start reading these support rules and the shooting rule, it really all comes down to where you place the leader in a, in a unit, right? Um, even for like shooting, like you trace shooting from the leader figure, right? So if you're using bigger bases that represent units, where's this leader figure? Now you have to come to some kind of understanding with your friends. Hopefully they're nice, right? Like how do you measure it? Where do you measure support from? I think when we first started playing, we were like, well, the unit next to him, you get support. And then it just didn't work because we had these crazy battles where one guy would go in, get support from four units, mm-hmm. they would lose and they'd all die. And then you know, the whole right. battle was over in one die roll. Mm-hmm. So I'm not a fan of the way it's written. And I think part of it, it goes back to our original comment that it's not a game that should be played with units. It's really more about like the Clash of Spears type game. That would be an equivalent kind of scale game that really should be. 
And um, so, sorry, con on the combat. All right, let's talk about presentation. Men of Bronze is your typical Osprey rulebook with plenty of color images, clearly laid out rules, unit stats, and a mix of generic and historical scenarios. Although it has a table of contents, it is lacking an index. Okay, here is Men of Bronze, and I'm gonna give its presentation a con. Unfortunately, it was really hard to find anything we really wanted to find. Without the index, it was kind of almost impossible. The table of context was okay, but for us, we were trying to play it with kind of units, not individual figures. It became really confusing trying to find the rules we wanted. So although it looks kind of pretty, it was really hard to kind of understand. So Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an Osprey book, so there it is. It's very glossy. There's kind of a lot going for it there, but uh, I think it's it, it's definitely more confusing than it needs to be. Uh, I'll even give as evidence that a lot of times when I see uh, frequently asked questions for this game online, the author will respond by referencing three or four sections of the book right. to come to a single <laughs> right, conclusion. Right, right, right. So that's, I mean, I'm sure that they had to get it out in, in a single draft and that they don't have an opportunity to, to mm -hmm. revise it but it feels like maybe it was rushed a little bit and that yeah. it's hard to find the things you need to find in a relatively short book where that should be easy. Yeah. What do you think, Austin? There's not much new that I can add to this, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> you, you all covered it fairly well. It, it, whenever we had to look up a rule, I, I had to look up a couple times in this book. I, I was flipping through page after page, like, ah, oh, where is it? Where is that? Right. I was like, okay, look at the table of contents. Oh, it should be in this rough area. Right. <laughs> you know, and then of course a couple times you guys would be like, oh, it's on page 10 or 11. So it, I feel like with this type of rule set, you have to put a couple of reps under your belt uh, yeah, before you sure. really, really start to grasp it in terms of where the rules are in the rule book. So, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's three cons, right? That's three cons. Someone keeping track of these cons? Of these cons? <laughs> <laughs> Should we get our Arate point stack going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next up is how units move. Movement is determined by where a unit's leader moves to. You move a leader, and then the formation of miniatures forms around that leader. Units move a distance of between five to eight base widths, depending on their type. So for movement in Men of Bronze, uh, I think I'm gonna give it another neutral. No, <laughs> is, no. Damn you, man. <laughs> Damn you. This is why we can't have nice things. Uh, I think it, it's very generic. Uh, it's very, loose in terms of how they allow for movement. It's clearly intended as a small scale skirmish game. I yeah. think the most interesting piece is that certain units get special movement types that they can only use if they have arete points spent on them, like skirmishers only skirmishing when they get arete points spent. But uh, it's, it's really quite generic and, and I almost forgot how it works in between filming. Uh, what do you think, uh, Austin? I mean, so to your neutral take mm -hmm. <laughs> of units having you know special you abilities, Switzerland. I guess I called you Switzerland. Uh, God, it's it's <laughs> the thing about movement that I really think is a pro for this rule set is that it's it's pretty simple to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you don't have to worry about spending extra movement to wheel and deal to try to get around you know certain units. It's if you're in phalanx, you go straight. If you're non phalanx, you can kind of just go the distance that you need to go for that unit. Uh, you know, of course, if you want to charge, you spend the erotic points that do it and whatnot. When I was playing the game, I didn't have to sit there for 10 minutes, think, oh my God, how am I going to mastermind this maneuver? It was just, okay, we move forward or we're going to move this way or that way. It, I thought it was a pro that it was easy to pick up. That's your pro. Uh, of course. Okay, yeah. I'm a con. <laughs> and the reason I'm a con is I feel like the game gets it, it gets it kind of half right. If you're playing this as an uh, individual figure, which I really think is how the game was written, then it's like it's kind of okay to move your units wherever you want because you're talking about moving eight guys. So whoever you are, it's, it's eight guys, right? If you're talking about this being a battle game, you can't just move... 150 guys any way they want. I don't care if they're a phalanx or not, right? So what is the game, right? Is it a unit game or is it an individual game? And I think the rules are kind of on both, right? Because if you're talking, it's eight figures, you don't make a phalanx of eight <laughs> figures, right? You don't, eight guys don't make a phalanx. They should move any way they want. Even right. worse, you, in our playtesting, we had multiple situations where you break a phalanx in the mm -hmm. same move, mm -hmm. have it move 
in this crazy wonky way to rear attack or flank another unit right. and form phalanx just before they do it all in one activation. But you see, yeah. that's, right. what on, it, that's what makes <laughs> it. That's what makes it. That's what makes it. Okay, so we we sort of talked about earlier that this is not like a in the weeds like super you know like detailed war right. game. This is supposed to be a very light pick up in an afternoon kind of beer and pretzel kind of thing. There is yeah. some tact to it, of course. Wow. But for the fact that it is relatively easy to pick up for the movement phase, yeah, that's where the pro, th like that's where like this is where the it's supposed to be. You know, okay. if you had all the spend extra for the wheel, oh, you can't go in this flank zone, or you have to start the charge in the rear, whatever it is, it just becomes too bogged down. It, it slows it. In, in my, this is not that type of rule set. This is a very okay. basic. All right, I'll say it's a pro. This is Austin. He's a man of bronze. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Out of all the cons always one. I said today. All right, so you're a pro con. con you're a con now. Firmly. I guess I'm a con at this point. Oh, <laughs> I'll keep my one neutral to my grave, right, but this not, one's a con. You're not, you're not Switzerland anymore. <laughs> okay. Finally, we are talking about the fun factor. Did we have fun while playing these rules? Did the fun increase the more we played it, or did it wane? Okay, so I would say when we played at the smaller scale, I had more fun. When we played at the larger 28 mil scale with you know larger units, it was not as fun. So in terms of a fun factor, if you're keeping it to the smaller scale, it's a pro. It is fun. But actually, you know, I'm gonna take it back. It's it's overall a con, just because the only <laughs> the only pro I had was the movement phase, and everything else was kind of like, well, it's it's men of bronze. <laughs> But you don't like I, that he I, called you an apologist. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe one of you guys can actually convince me either way, because I'm on the fence. Oh, hey, Matt, what, did you have fun? No. No fun. Uh, <laughs> it was, right. I mean, that's an Osprey book, so it's it's like a good time a couple times, but I would not continue. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Good time, Osprey book. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Call this number. There for a short time. Right, okay. Not a great time. <laughs> All right, fun factor. Um, I think I'm going to give it a con. And the because the only thing I really liked about it was the arete points, yeah, right? yeah, that's and, true. And I that's what I kept coming back to as fun. But as I said earlier, it really wasn't an ancient kind of feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could use steal it and use it for anything else we do because it's you know, like you said, it's resource management. You get all kinds of choices. But um, again, I don't care for for hoplite warfare, so well, I'm going to give it a a big con. Okay, bonus round. Uh, do you have this? Is the famous bonus round that I said stick around for? What's your bonus? No bonus. There's no bonus here. There's no bonus to be found. Oh. Bonus? <laughs> I can't think of anything that would just add on to what we've already said or anything new. I can't think of a bonus, so no, no bonus, honestly. No, that's not a good sign. No. All right. Uh, the only bonus I would say is in the back of the rule book, right? There are scenarios. Mm. And I think that, unfortunately, <laughs> that shows you the problem with the game because it has the kind of generic scenarios that I am sure, and don't quote me on this, but I'm sure, you know, like the game designer played and put in there. But then I'm sure for saleability and marketability, he put in like Marathon and the, the big battles you want to see. But his battles are very small, like Protect the Sheep, mm -hmm. and then he goes to the Battle of Marathon. So it's very, you know... Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in that. So there are scenarios in there, but I think they point to the issues with the rules. Okay, we have the final tally. We have three pros and 11 cons. So I think essentially from our take, we wouldn't really recommend this as we feel it's a rule set that's not quite baked and it doesn't know what it's about really. And you might buy it thinking it does one thing, and you'll just be frustrated. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, playing other Osprey games, like Lion Rampant and all that, like I had more fun with those other Osprey, but mm -hmm. not not so much with Men of Bronze, unfortunately. Yeah. Not a winner. Yeah. Not a winner. I think, like us, you would really want to make a lot of house rules and a mm -hmm. lot of changes. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know, is it really worth it? So... We hope you like this video. We're going to do more rules reviews. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. we got a lot of great stuff coming up. Thanks for sticking with us. We'll see you next time in the game room. Subscribe and hit that like button to all our videos. Thanks a lot.